Hey, Lyons. Good morning. Hey, could you could you join as a panelist? Uh, I thought I did that. No, it says you're an attendee. Did you use the? Um, I sent the email. Oh. I used the. Yeah, sure. I used the. Um, the link on the agenda. The link on the agenda. Yeah. yeah so I I had sent you a. Um, okay. Yeah. You know. I'll go. I'll go find it. Okay. Thanks. Okay, that was more difficult than it should have been. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you found it. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I put yeah. it in a special place so it wouldn't get lost. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Yeah, so I'm sure there's a way to bring attendees in as panelists, but uh, just if it's just easier yeah. to find the actual email. Um, so yeah, I have a. Um, I put together just a little. PowerPoint for that watershed section. And it has the maps that I shared with you guys, the, those other maps I sent yesterday. Um, so I think I think we're good with at least just, you know, showing the watershed, showing where conserved lands are and showing where the solar sites are. Um, yeah, so I think that's good. You know what, I wanna make you a co-host if I can do that. I can. I'm making you a co-host. That way, um, as we're going through, like if I'm presenting or whatever, and then you see some attendees that maybe raised their hands. Um, now that I, now that you're a co-host, I think if you click on the attendees column, you can allow them to speak. Um, so it just might be easier if both of us can allow people to speak. Sure. Okay. Good. <clears throat> So, yeah. But panelists, we don't have to do that. They just 
they can speak in whenever. Right. Okay. Yep. Yep. Morning, so, Jason. Morning. Sorry morning, Amy. Morning, guys. <laughs> I had the video off. <sighs> Impending storm in many ways <laughs> on multiple <laughs> levels today. Multiple levels, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I have another one at 10 o'clock. Oh, wow. A, a pending storm with a client. Ooh. Gotcha. It was interesting, though, this is like this snowstorm coming over the weekend. That's who even knows. But um, <laughs> we, we inevitably, like first snowstorm that's going to give us any number of inches. We always get a call from the local paper where they want to do an article. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I'm like, we put on the plows and we plow until there's no more snow on the road. <laughs> when it's all. Yeah. If, if it comes down, we'll, we'll push it away. Exactly. Yeah. It's just. It doesn't. Well, you know, we're ready. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's interesting that every year, like they, they kind of do the same, the same article. I have a neighbor who, um, last week wanted um, our local buildings and grounds committee who takes care of snow here at our complex um, to consider using less salt because it's the right thing to do. So, you know, I feel like five years this comes up. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. this long email about how ah, we tried the, the beer and molasses liquid stuff you know 10 years ago and it you know it it works but the delivery system's really challenging right you know if if i had a warm garage with a floor drain and hot water and i could rinse the system when we're done using it every single time that'd be great right but i don't right. <laughs> all i have is cold water and a driveway where it's all going to freeze and you really don't want that right you know so we do this and so we do that and there's this kind of storm and there's that kind of storm and and then there's there's just the storm that's a complete mess and and you think you got it all figured out and you plan for it and it just it all ends up happening the wrong way and all you get is ice and there's right. nothing you can do about it absolutely nothing you can do about it except put down more salt right after the fact so, anyway. yeah I just finished writing that email yesterday. Well received by some yeah, and yeah. offensive to others. I, I feel like we could take <laughs> some of that and plug that right into some of our response to yeah. citizens as well, because it's, you know, it's the same challenges that we all have. How do you right. now that's exactly what it is. Putting enough charge... material without too much, but also making sure that the roads are safe without wasting right. material. You know, it's just, it's such a delicate balancing act. Right. In general, so but we're I, all I have your job on a very local level, and yes, that was exactly. my response to the public. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so. Anyway, that's great. Jason, did you um, see my uh, question about possibly being a speaker at Rotary? I did. Um, <laughs> yeah, I. I prefer to decline if possible. Um, <laughs> Guilford, Guilford spearheads most of those projects. Uh -huh. um, so he might okay. be a better one to, to have at it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. And I'm, I'm gonna look to Beth for notice on this as we're kind of chattering and waiting for the meeting to start. But I believe that we have several people that we don't see on the screen, but that are watching in right now as well, just for us to know. Correct? Right. Yes. Well, we're at. Yeah. Uh, All right. So I, I made um, lines a co host so that so the attendees, um, you know, when we get to public comment, if, if the attendees and lines, you should probably say this in the beginning that people should raise their hands if they have yep. questions during public comment. And when we see the hands raised, um, you know, we can go into the attendee 
column and allow those people to speak and we'll do it in order of who raised their hands first and all, all those normal meeting procedures. Okay, so it's uh, now after eight o'clock and I am gonna get this meeting started. Um, so the first thing I need to do is read you the following notice um, because this is a virtual meeting. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. If you can hear me, you're doing that. Hopefully everyone who wants to has been able to join. So our next order of business is, I'm gonna lay out the agenda shortly for those who can't see it. Although if you're joining us, you've probably seen it. Um, we're gonna talk about the drinking water regulations, the proposed drinking water regulations. Um, then we'll talk about water supply status, then water infrastructure project updates, the Hadley interconnection. Uh, then we'll talk about watershed activities, uh, activities within the watershed. Um, and then um, we'll have some closing uh, business related to next meetings and any other items that uh, didn't make it on the agenda. So with that, um, let's get started with the drinking water, proposed drinking water regulations. And I believe Amy is going to um, fill us in. Well, and this, um, this is just kind of going back to, if you guys recall um, in, in January, 2020, so right before COVID, um, we had sent out the, drink, the proposed drinking water regulations for the town to adopt um, because the before it goes forward to town council, they want, if there's a committee that knows the business better, they, they like to have them put a set of eyes on it and just kind of review and comment or um, you know, kind of recommend it to them. Um, so you guys looked at this back in 2020 and then COVID hit. And so the conversation that was gonna have with town council kind of got kicked down the road so long that um, it's going to come before town council uh, in February. And so I, I just wanted to kind of circle back with this committee and just see if there was, you know, if everyone's okay with, you know, holding with the, you know, approval that you guys gave in 2020, or if there was any additional conversation or comment on that before um, it gets discussed at the town council level. So I know Lyons sent the draft, um, those draft regulations around to you guys. With the with the meeting announcements and it, again they're the same as what we looked at in 2020. So does uh, anyone have any additional comments on on those draft regulations? Any updates or things you see differently now than our discussions over a year ago? I do not. So then I, I guess see, with, I, I don't see any. So great. With, with we, that, we reviewed them. We reviewed them. We discussed it again today. There, there's no no need to change um, anything based okay. on our input. Okay. So you know, with that, that's good. So and do we know when? It's going to be discussed at town council yet. It, do they have a? Uh, la it, the date has changed. The most recent date um, is February 28th. Um, so it got pushed back a couple of weeks from when we were initially talking about it. Um, and, and what I believe the outcome of this is going to be, Lyons, as we discussed, was you know, you'll write a, 
a memo to the town council saying the water supply and protection committee has reviewed this and you know recommends that the town council accept it or however we want to word that and then kind of offer that if they have questions because it's going to get it's going to go to a committee it's going to get referred to a committee and so i don't know when when what conversations are going to happen and when it's useful for you to be there but certainly putting that offer out there that you're willing to be involved in those okay. conversations so great so end of february at the earliest at this point yeah okay that's fine great. uh anything else on this topic this morning i i think one attendee has has a question on the reg so let me just let her speak. Um, Judy, you can you can ask your question. Yes, thank you. Um, because I only recently discovered that you were a committee, I haven't been paying much attention to this, but Pelham has a, a very strong interest in understanding uh, when and how and if we should comment on what you want to do in watershed areas in Pelham, because we are trying to protect as much forest land as possible. So I was, I just wanted a little bit of recap, but if, if it can wait until February, that's okay. I just want you to be aware that we are following this now, even if we haven't before. <laughs> do, Lyons, do you want me to talk to this? Have, have you seen the, the draft regulations? No, I have not. I only just discovered that you were having this meeting. And so I, I tuned in just to, to learn basically, and I'm happy to sit here quietly, but it's not a usual posture for me. <laughs> um, can I suggest that we send you uh, a copy that you can review and um, they're fairly, in my opinion, fairly straightforward. Uh, okay. I don't think there's anything particularly controversial in them, but uh, maybe you have uh, things that that you'd like to propose or add, and um, and those could be uh, submitted to the town. That's fine. I'll put my email into the chat for you to copy down. Okay. Okay, Amy. Yeah, I, I was just going to, Judy, to your point, these are regulations that it's it's kind of like the contract between the town of Amherst as a water supplier and the water users in town. And so I think the point of what you're curious about, that's not what these regulations are. Um, it's more like the water user, not the water supply protection piece. So okay. you can well, hold your comments to later on when we're talking about water supply. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you very much. Both yes. Of you. All right, anything else on the drinking water regulations? Great, then we will move on to the status of the water supply. Um, Beth, you have an yeah. update. Yeah, I just wanna let everybody know John Tobison is trying to find his link. <laughs> so hopefully he'll be joining us um, shortly too. But yeah, let me share my screen, I'll just, to our usual look through the um, the web page and look at the water supply. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes. All right, so here's the water supply status web page. Um, it's updated through the end of December. Um, so in December, uh, we were still relying primarily on the Atkins Reservoir. Um, at least 50% of our drinking water was coming from the reservoir. And that's due to the continued um, slow production of well number four. Well number four is down to 10%. Um, and again, we're looking at December. But the um, distribution of where the water is coming from is very similar to the to the last meeting that we had. Um, things haven't really changed very much. And then the water levels at Atkins itself. 
this is nice because it shows the whole year. Um, and everybody knows we had a very um, wet year. So 2021 is the dark blue line. Um, comes along right here, kind of following the 15 year average. And then here we are at the end of December, um, highest it's ever been. <laughs> it's the top. Um, so that's good. So we're in a good place at the end of December for the Atkins Reservoir. And highest, highest it's been in the last five years. Right. Yep, exactly. Highest it's been in the last five years, a little bit above the 15 year average, 2006 to 2020. So that's good. Um, and then water, water use in 2021. Um, 2021 are the purple bars. Um, again, in December, we were below 2019 and below the 10 year average for consumption or use. Um, and that is pretty consistent throughout um, 2021. We were below and you know, 2021, things started to be a little bit more normal with consumption compared to 2020 um, due to the impacts from COVID. Um, so, you know, you can say that, that, that the universities have been open um, and still the consumption is, is a little lower. So that's good too. And it's, it's interesting to look at the whole year. Um, so there's that. And then precipitation in 2021, again, very wet year. So here's 2021 dark blue line. Um, we didn't get as much precipitation, uh, total um, yearly precipitation as 2018, um, but we still got a lot of rain last year. So hence the reservoirs are full and um, we're in a good position and if relative to drought, we have, we have plenty of water going into 2022. So that, that's it, that's the web page. It's up all the time. I update it monthly. Um, you'll see at the end of January that things like the, the 15 year average line and everything will change a little bit because we update those at uh, the beginning of every year. And that's it. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I'm gonna stop sharing then. I have one, it's Jack. Yes. So, uh, is there what's what's the uh, uh, there's probably a dam for Atkins Reservoir, correct yes. for spillover. What what elevation is that compared to the you know maximum levels that we're uh, observing? The maximum level that we're observing. Well, the it's not going over the spillway. <laughs> <laughs> How much freeboard is is there? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I'm not sure. Like as of today, I don't know, maybe Amy knows. Yeah, so Atkins Reservoir, it's a unique reservoir because normally you've got a reservoir where a stream comes in, it gets impounded in the reservoir. And then, you know, if once that's full, it's going over the dam on the far end and continuing on the stream. And Atkins is kind of, I almost call it like an offline reservoir because if water doesn't go in, to Atkins, it continues on a stream over here rather than going into the reservoir. So it never spills over the dam on the far end. It instead gets diverted to continue down. I get messed up the Dean and Nurse and uh, those brooks up there. So I forget the exact name of the brook. But anyway, we have a diversion going into it where water either gets kind of diverted offline from this stream and into the reservoir to get impounded or it continues on down the stream. Um, so it's a little bit of an odd question, but when we're at zero as shown, you know, zero below level, that's we we have this stick that floats and that's how we measure um, the level in the reservoir. And so when it's at zero, it's still a couple feet below that, you know, spillway that you see. Um, but that's kind of the the maximum that we can, the maximum that we've always measured based on like what zero is. So I hope that makes sense. 
My understanding, Jack, is that the Atkins Reservoir was built in uh, an adjacent reservoir to the adjacent watershed to the one in which the stream flows that fills it. And when the reservoir was built, the diversion on the brooks was built to fill the reservoir. But that brook didn't flow naturally through where the reservoir is. Yeah. Um, and there, so the divide between the two was, was very small. Um, and a, a mechanical or engineering diversion built into the stream was enough to push the water around the corner and a little bit of excavation. And then it, and, and that's how it's controlled. It's an interesting little, uh, feature in the woods yeah sounds like we could go, do a, a, a go and a, go and find it sounds like we could do a committee field trip you know sometime sure, <laughs> sure. it was a yeah it was a um hydro fields um what's it called i don't know we went there and looked at it as part of the hydro class at umass uh whatever it was 20 some years ago. So I'd be happy to go out there and, and look at it with folks if, uh, if you're interested. Thank you. Uh, any other questions on that? No, okay. Um, so let's move on to water infrastructure and Beth is gonna give us an update on the replacement of well number four. Yes. Um, well, number four, um, we are working, still working through the permitting process. We uh, recently got an approval letter from DEP for, for well number four, and uh, that just happened in the last couple of days. So we're working through what that letter says, um, conditions and things that are on it. So we're still working through that process. And we've um, heard from the drillers that the pitless adapter is going to arrive any day now. So, and they already have, yay, they already have the um, pump, 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 and pump motor um, that arrived a little few weeks ago. So, they'll have everything they need. Um, we need to discuss, you know, doing this work in the winter, um, you know, versus the, sort of the schedule. Um, so that's all good news. Get through the permitting, and we have the equipment that we need. So that that's an impending improvement. Um, and then well number one at this point too um, is a, is probably going to get its pump. It's probably going to get a new pump um, and a new column and a new shaft. So that well is actually pulled at the moment and those parts are also on order and are coming. Um, so both of those wells will be getting some new equipment, which is really great. Can I infer from what you said that uh, while you might now have all the parts to drill at well number four, that doing so in the winter may not, might cost more or might be just too much of a pain. And if you're discussing whether to put it off until slightly warmer weather, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I think right now we're still just looking at this approval letter that we got from DEP this week and seeing, you know, the conditions and seeing what they're going to re requiring us to do. And then also, it's it's easier to run into problems when you do anything, especially when it involves water, obviously, in the winter months. So um, we'll be we'll be talking with the drillers about that and, um, you know, move forward in the best possible way with that. But I guess I could say that before our next meeting, next September, you should see some some changes out at well number four. Um, yeah, and that that's all. Amy, do you have anything else to say about that? No, you answered that question great. So, okay. That's cool. One. Ah, uh, you're here. Yeah. Welcome, yeah. John. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't find the email in the thousands I get. So. Um, uh is well number four what's its production capabilities at the moment 
Amy? Are you talking? Are you talking current well number four or the new replacement well number four? Current. I said that. Current. Remote. Okay. Number four. I yeah. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head. I want to say that the capacity, like we talked about last time, the capacity is about ten percent of what it is designed for. So I think it's at like one hundred and fifty GPM sort of capacity. So. Okay. Good. Thanks. Yep. Anything else on well number four? No, I think that's it. Okay. So let's move on to the water line extension. Leverett, Jason? I'll talk about that one. So yeah, we finished uh, about 8,000 feet of water main from um, roughly the intersection of Bridge Street and East Leverett Road, uh, out East Leverett Road to T. Waddle Hill Road, and uh, hooked up, I want to say, six houses to town water that were receiving bottled water from the town of Leverett due to some uh, landfill contamination uh, leachate plume. So we hooked up the six houses. They're all very pleased. Um, the two borings under the rivers proved to be very difficult. Uh, we ended up downsizing the pipe under the river from a 12 inch pipe to an eight inch pipe because they got the borehole through, but they then they continued to get the 12 inch pipe stuck. Um, so we ended up having to downsize the pipe under the main river from 12 to eight. Uh, the remaining, the rest of the main is 12 inch, um, except the main on T Waddle is eight inch. And then there's a two inch service that got bored under another brook to serve the final house. So it all went off well. There was uh, the ledge under both brooks was very difficult. Uh, and it it, uh, it took a lot of extra to the water main was done for a while while the borers were still there. Um, so but they finally got it done, got everything in all the houses hooked up. Um, and everything has been working well. We did have a small, small slight problem with some air trapped in the line, um, which we've been flushing and trying to take care of. But the, the last how actually, I guess the, the last couple houses in the line have some cloudy water due to air entrapment. But we're hoping that we'll, we'll we'll keep flushing it and trying to get it out, and hopefully eventually we'll get it out because there's no there's nowhere where the air can be getting into the main. It's just it's trapped in there from the construction process and from the boring and everything else. So there's a couple of dips and sags that make it difficult to flush it out. But we've been working on it. Other than that, everything's everyone's happy who's gotten connected, and and they're they're pleased to no longer be on bottled water. I bet. Uh, any questions about the waterline extension? Okay, seeing none, let's move on to the Centennial. Amy? Centennial, um, yeah. The, really, we're in, a, we're in a position, there's kind of two things going on with it. So one, the design continues to march along. We're actually nearing completion of the design. And so hopefully, um, you know, it could be bid relatively soon uh, for construction. Um, so that's exciting. And again, it would probably be about a, I want to say it's a two year from when we would bid to when it would be operational. It, you know, it certainly is a lengthy construction process and permitting process and everything for that. Um, kind of parallel to that, we do did wanna, apply. Do you want to back up and give us two sentences for the folks oh. who are here? about what is centennial what is centennial yes sorry thank Just you a couple of sentences um, would be sure helpful. um so the centennial water treatment plan is one of our two large surface water treatment plants that the town of amherst has uh it's up in pelham uh so it takes water from the holly hills and intake reservoir it's a little three reservoir system up there um and and basically over the years i think it i want to say it's it opened in it was either 1981 or 1991, and I, I can't recall which, but either way, over the years, the, the technology that we had just wasn't um, treating the water in the way, it wasn't treating the water as efficiently, so we got lower production because it had to work harder than it was designed. Um, so when it was 
scheduled for kind of the replacement of all the media and the rehab, we decided instead we're going to do a brand new treatment facility with technology that's more appropriate for the water quality that we get in. Um, so it's going to be a dissolved air flotation um, treatment plant, where before it was, you know, the traditional um, flocculation sedimentation <laughs> treatment train. Um, so, um, yeah, so this has been, it's been offline for, I think, three or four years now and will be um, as we've been designing and working through this whole process and hopefully it'll be back online soon. Um, yeah, so um, the, the other kind of train that's going on with this is that we did apply for um, SRF funding um, and we are waiting to hear really any day now we should be hearing um, a decision on F SRF funding. But if we do get that, then that will delay the schedule because there are certain um, processes that we would have to go through and there are certain conditions that would have to be integrated into the um, construction documents to comply with the SRF uh, funding requirements. So what's SRF? Oh, it's the state revolving loan. Um, so it's a it's a program that the state has to offer um, low interest um, financing for large water and wastewater infrastructure projects. So, but it's a competitive process. So they have X amount of money. You have to apply, and then they they assign points based on the critical needs and a lot of different factors and they'll assign as deep into that point list as they have the funding to do. So um, the good news is that um, with the Biden infrastructure money in the state of Massachusetts, that money is actually funneling through the SRF um, program for the next several years. So I think um, there are more opportunities in the next few years for um, funding for these types of projects than there were in the past. Thank you. Any questions about Centennial Water Treatment Plant? Great. We, we discussed this quite a bit in prior meetings, so that's good. Uh, great. We'll move on to the Hadley Interconnection. Uh, Amy? Sure. Um, so some folks might have seen an article in the paper um, that referred to um, Hadley and Amherst working together. And basically uh, we're trying to partner on resiliency in general, you know, the, the resiliency of our water system. Um, and part of that is we have interconnections right now where we can provide water to Hadley and vice versa. Um, the connection to Hadley is Hadley's at a lower pressure than the town of Amherst, like their um, the pressure of their water. Um, so we can easily provide water to them. We just have a you know pressure reducing valve, and we have a meter, and water can just flow from Amherst into Hadley. Um, right now, if they wanted to supply water to us, we would have to do a hydrant to hydrant connection and pump water because we don't have the infrastructure there to do that. Um, so we're looking at you know, various ways that we can not only be able to get water in return if we want it to help improve our resiliency, but then also ways that we can partner together on um, new sources or, um, you know, increased capacity. So again, so we can rely on each other at times when we need um, additional water supply. So that's what's going on there. Any questions on the Hadley interconnection, John? Amy, is the is it the physical interconnection on um, Route Nine? Is that the one? Is there one connection there? That, or is there is it another location? We have two, um, and so yeah, one of them is it's not quite on Route Nine. It's actually on the Green Leaves Drive. Yeah, uh, but that yeah. one we don't. That's the one that we don't necessarily use as much. The, the good one is on Meadow Street, and that's oh, the one where that we, put, yeah, okay. we put the new vault there recently with the pressure yep. reducing valve and everything. Where in the past, I, I think the one on Green Leaves, I don't even know if it's hard piped or if it's, it's certainly not metered. Um, yeah, it's, so. it's hard piped, but we have to throttle the valve because of the pressure differential. 
Yeah. So we use the Meadow Street one. And that's where if we were to put any sort of kind of pump station, that's probably where it would go. So is is there a cost basis for what we share with Hadley or what they share with us? Didn't they have a uh, moratorium on water usage last summer? I'm not sure if they had um, they 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 probably had water use restrictions over the summer. We have supplied them with water a few times when their well had to have some rehab work done. And so the well maybe was pulled for a week or a month while the rehab happened. And um, and so we provided water to supplement their source. We just charge them the water rate the same as any other water customer in town. So they get charged the same, you know, per hundred cubic feet that you get charged at <laughs> at your house for water use. So, so it'd be the same vice versa if we took anything from them. I, I imagine it would be. Um, we actually haven't ever done that. Do that. I think with the exception of 1980, which was a while ago. And that's part of what we're talking to them is, you know, putting also putting together, you know, MOUs between the communities. And so that's that's happening above our head just to just to kind of codify all this stuff. Great. Yeah. If I could Thanks. ask one other thing, uh, Ryan. Um, uh, yeah. Amy, the, I thought uh, Scott did a good job, a pretty good job in that article, except I thought it was, I think, misstated, misleading, referred to the storage tank on Mount Warner as a water source, which of course is not the case. Storage tanks are not water sources, they're just storage. Did he mean that there's the notion of uh, doing treatment at the Mount Warner well and returning that to be a viable source? Because tanks that's, are not. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's 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 more a Hadley question, but I do know that they have been talking and exploring, looking at the Mount Warner wells and seeing if they can put treatment in place to bring those wells back online to help, um, yeah. help give more resiliency to their system. Right, right, because they just have the wells off the Fort River there, on Bay Road. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I, next time I run into Scott. I'll continue our dialogue on technical things. All right. <clears throat> Anything else on the interconnection with Hadley? Great, and we will move on to watershed activities. Um, we're back to Beth. Oh, you're Probably. muted. All right. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen again. I just put a little presentation together. All right, so um, we wanted to start off by just um, looking at the watershed and uh, and sharing some of the more recent conservation efforts that have gone on out there. You know, we have some new members on the committee and I'm not sure um, how much we've, uh, how much everybody has seen our watershed map. Um, so, and I, I did mail these out to you guys. Um, so this is, this are the two watersheds. This is the, uh, the Atkins. I don't know if you can see my cursor. I hope you can, but. Yes. Yeah, um, great. The purple line is the delineation of the two watersheds. The northern watershed that's mostly in Chutesbury is for the Atkins Reservoir, which is over here. Um, the southern watershed is mostly in Pelham, and that's for our Pelham Reservoir system. Um, this is the, uh, the Hill Reservoir right there. They're, they're kind of faded back a little bit, but there's the Hill Reservoir, the Holly Reservoir, and the intake reservoir right there. Um, so these are the two watersheds um, and the map shows land that Amherst owns within the watersheds and that's shaded in the, in the purple. Um, green is Coles land in uh, the watersheds. Um, blue is land that's either owned by um, the towns of Shrewsbury and Pelham or the state mostly DCR or institutions, colleges, universities. Um, 
And then there's a little bit of land on the map that's marked as being owned by Wamiko. Um, so when we talk about the watersheds, these are the, this is the land areas that we're referring to. Um, so recent activities in the watershed, um, the Khrushchev, Khrushchev, I'm not sure how you even say that, but I think it's Khrushchev property was bought by the town of Amherst back uh, in 2019, which seems like a while ago, but I'm not sure we've ever talked about it at um, one of our water supply protection committee meetings. Um, and it's this little parcel here. It's about 16 acres. Um, it's part of you know the headwaters for the Amethyst Brook. And um, the town, as I said, the town bought it in 2019 um, using funds from the uh, drinking water, the state drinking water supply protection grant funding. Um, and then uh, more recently, just north of that, so also the headwaters of the Amethyst Brook is a 32 acre parcel that's um, bounded in green here that the town of Shutesbury is currently working with Kestrel Land Trust to hopefully purchase for conservation land um, in 2022. And um, I know that they're doing things like going to the CPAC in the next you know, few months to try to um, secure the funding to buy that. So, so those will both be new um, parcels within our watershed that are uh, conserved and protected. Um, and another recent um, conservation effort within the watershed was uh, is the creation of the Walter Coles Jones Working Forest, um, which is she is is hatched here, um, and it's it's over two thousand acres. Um, so it's land owned by Coles, and they worked with the state, I think, and the federal government to put a conservation restriction on all this land, um, which uh, the majority of it is in Shutesbury. The majority of the 2000 acres is within the Atkins Reservoir watershed. There's a little bit over here that's outside the watershed, a little down here that's actually in the, the Pelham watershed. Um, but that was done in or finalized really in 2020. Um, the conservation restriction um, that's held by mass Department of Fish and Game um, and ensures that there can't be any future development um, into perpetuity. Um, and it also ensures public access um, for hunting and fishing and hiking and other passive recreation. Um, Cole still owns the land and they can still forest the land. But um, in terms of watershed protection of our watershed, um, that's a real a uh, big bonus for the watershed. You know, we, as a town, as a, as a water department, keep an eye on any kind of development that happens in the watershed. And this just took over 2,000 acres um, off of our responsibility of keeping an eye on um, real development, you know, in forever, which is, which is, a, which is a great thing. So that is also a recent conservation effort in the watershed. Um, and then we have some potential solar projects um, in the watershed. And this map's got a few of the uh, protective layers on it too, which we can talk about. Um, but I just, we just wanted to point out there are three projects within the Atkins Reservoir watershed and one proposed project in the um, Pelham system watershed. There haven't been any actual uh, project development designs submitted um, to Shutesbury or Pelham for these projects. The wetland delineations for some of them have been um, submitted to the Shutesbury and Pelham Conservation Commissions. Uh, the Pratt Corner East wetland delineation and the Pratt Corner South wetland delineation have been approved by the Shutesbury Conservation Commission. And I believe the Tower Road delineation is under review by the Pelham Shutesbury Conservation Commission at the moment. Um, 
and then some of the watershed protection layers that I just have turned on here is the mass drinking water regulations, um, zone A, B, and C for surface water. So um, I don't want to get into really the details about what these uh, regulations and restrictions include. I can We can send that information out, but the map at least just shows you the areas that are covered. Um, zone A is 400 feet around a surface water source, and then also 200 feet on either side of all tributaries. So that's what these kind of snake looking things are. Um, zone B is this hatching here, and that's within a half mile around any actual surface surface water source. So half mile around Atkins Reservoir. Um, and then zone C is basically everything else within the watershed. Um, but then just in terms of the solar projects, other uh, watershed protection that's that's in place is zoning. Um, Shutesbury and Pelham are both um, up to date with their zoning, and they both include they both have in their town zoning watershed protection. Um, for example, Pelham's got a water water supply overlay district. Shutesbury has um, relatively progressive zoning that they put in place in two thousand eight um, that focuses on open space protection um, and watershed protection. Um, both towns have recent um, solar bylaws. Shoots for 2016, Pelham very recent in 2020. So these are all protections. Um, and then the Wetlands Protection Act, which as I mentioned, Shoots for and Pelham Conservation Commissions will review projects that are within their jurisdiction around wetland areas. Um, so yeah, we're just kind of want to give an overview. I know this is the first time that this committee's um, seen all this information. So we're just taking kind of a general look at it all. Um, and then what could the Water Supply Protection Committee's role be with these? Um, Again, this is this is all sort of a general introduction. There's been a lot of public interest in these potential projects, um, and then some questions of how Amherst um, is looking in terms of the watershed. So that's uh, why we wanted to start talking about it today. Um, so one potential role for the Water Supply Protection Committee is to provide opinion, an opinion on um, impact to drinking water from solar development. And that could take the form of sort of a tech, technical document um, that's got information from other solar projects and research. Um, and that could be potentially provided to the Shutesbury and Pelham um, Conservation Commission or planning boards if they request it. Um, you know, that's kind of the direction I think we should go. That would be the most useful thing I would think for those committees would to would be to get some kind of a, of a technical opinion from a, a group like our group. Um, so we are looking for anyone who has any experience with these things or is interested in working on that kind of a document with staff. Um, and I think I, all, I shared these maps with the Water Supply Protection Committee, a resident submitted these maps um, and, you know, they're, main reason is that our GIS layers are as updated as we can get them to be. And um, we just want to make sure that the information that we present is as accurate as possible. Um, so these are some maps that are resident. So what's interesting with, with this map here is that the actual shapes of the solar sites are more accurate than what, what was on the previous maps that we were just showing. So that may be helpful to folks. Um, and that is all I had on that. So we're open to um, questions and comments on, on this. I, I can't see. Um, well, maybe I can see. 
I might stop sharing so I can see who's got questions. Okay. I can, um, I can, I can share again. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so if, um, if you, there we go. So I'm just gonna start at the top of my list uh, with Aaron. Go ahead. Um, thank you. I was just curious um, if there's been any sort of analysis of the Atkins uh, watershed as far as um, the total acreage that's been protected and um, also if there's a goal for the amount of acreage to be protected in the Atkins watershed. We, we certainly, we definitely know the acreage that, that is protected. I mean, it's protected in different, different ways as those maps were showing, you know, some land is owned by the town of Amherst. So some of it was bought with things like the water supply protection grant. So, you know, it, it, it was specifically purchased for water supply protection, whereas some land is conservation land owned by the town of Pelham or the town of Shrewsbury. Right. So that has different, um, protections on it, different conservation restrictions are, have been placed on them at different levels. And they were also, a lot of the land was bought at different times. You know, there's some land that was just strictly bought in 1946 by the town of Amherst and no grants were used or anything. It's just land that we own. There may, you know, there's, so there's sort of different levels of, um, of conservation that, that's out there, but we certainly know the acreage. There's no doubt that we no total acreage that we own, total acreage of land that's protected in, in a variety of different ways. Yeah. Do we know what percentage that is that's currently protected and what our goal for overall um, conservation, you know, to protect the drinking water supply is in that watershed? I don't know offhand the actual percentage. I can certainly, I, we can definitely calculate that. I was um, just curious. I don't, like if it was half the watershed or more than half or like kind of what the what the goal and what our current um, level of protection is out there. Just because it serves, would you say 50% of the town and um, just be interesting to know kind of yeah, what percentage well, just, of it's. Just looking at the maps that I was just showing the, the Pelham, especially the Pelham um, water system looks to, yeah. to be more than 50%. <clears throat> Um, I don't know exactly what it is, but just looking at the maps, you can see mm -hmm. how much land, especially the, the town of Amherst owns in that Pelham system. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so in terms of goals, I, you know, I don't know if there's ever been a, a set goal for um, how much of the watershed to preserve. I think, um, you know, as time goes on, parcels that come available, especially if there's a willing seller if someone's interested in preserving their land in either of those towns, um, we always look at it mm -hmm. for water supply protection. Okay, right. uh, Chris. Okay. I, was just, I was just trying to look at the conservation restriction map and the proposal and, and and I see now that there are exclusions where those solar um, proposals are so I just I don't know if there's like I, I'm I'm guessing that was done be, you know deliberately with those pl um, projects in mind I guess I guess I was just interested if there what those discussions were or how that was thought of or if that ex those exclusions were um, done you know, to make it possible for these um, for these possible projects. I guess I was just looking for a little bit of the history if we know any of that. I don't think we really know. Um, it, that's what it certainly looks like, I guess you could say, you know, um, but I, I, I don't think anybody on this committee was necessarily part of any of those discussions. I presume that the Coles land, like all the other land, is was purchased it, you know, one parcel at a time, over time, and uh, so it's fairly easy to uh, work with uh, a subset of the total number of parcels that you own. 
I don't think we know. Uh, other questions, comments from the committee on the proposed solar projects? Does anyone have interest in working on? Oh, I think John has his hand up. All right. Yep. Brian, too. Um, I mean, my only comment, Beth, is that you, I think the committee and others should look for studies that do things that are sometimes referred to as paired watershed studies and other things like this, where you compare, say, runoff or groundwater uh, infiltration, water quality, and water amounts for similar parcels that do and don't have solar arrays on them. For example, um, solar arrays at impervious surface elevated above the ground, but there's still the impervious surface below them. So it's complicated, right, in terms of hydrology and, and water quality. It's not straightforward. Uh, mm -hmm. Also a construction project. So like any project, like forestry, there's short-term effects and longer-term effects. So there's always disruption of the forest that has to be dealt with appropriately by things to impact, to limit, limit short-term, you know, uh, acute impacts to rivers and streams, the kind of things DCR does in all its watersheds in the Quabbin and watch you sit in terms of forest and Amherst and its forest activities. So I, mean, I, I think there's no, it's all the same issue you look at with respect to water quality and watersheds. I, I don't know the science or the, the studies, you know, what's what's on the studies. Like any project, um, you, can, you can look at pictures and times and have uh, uh, it, it's really hard to disturb the soil and not have the potential for what looks to be a really severe short-term acute impact. It's just, that's just the nature of things. And it could even be not a construction project that causes that, just a transport of a vehicle. Um, uh, take a look at the, the power line work that's going on right now, the kind of work, the kind of intense activity that goes on. So anyway, I would just, I'm sure the committee, the town should think about all those issues like like other, other things. Uh, yeah, I feel, you know, I feel like, like you said, the short term impacts are similar to typical construction projects. And a mm -hmm. lot of that is um, uh, dealt with with the town conservation commissions, it, as long as if they're in wetland yeah. jurisdiction, which in this case, a few of them are. Um, I guess I'm thinking of, of this committee, particularly just because of the, the technical quality we have here with this group of um, maybe more long-term effects um, from solar just, and it would involve some research and that kind of thing, but, you know, just providing Amherst, the town of Amherst, um, just some a technical document that, that gets into that a little bit. And I'm just interested if anybody would be willing to work on that, or again, if anyone has any experience with it. Um, um, Brian and Jack both have their hands up. Let's go in that order. Great. Um, well, first of all, I, I agree with just about everything John said, um, or certainly the, the spirit of it. One uh, issue, John, is it's a great suggestion to look into paired watershed studies, to what's out there, um, and wouldn't it be nice if someone had done something on this? There is virtually nothing on the impacts of solar, large-scale solar on um, changes to soil moisture, changes to runoff, changes to recharge. Um, there are, is an abundance of white papers, there's abundance of consulting reports, and I think there's a huge wealth of information that's out there, and um, I have to apologize to folks in the participant panel. Um, there's too many academics here um, on this committee, but um, it's waiting for a proposal, um, it's some, and it's something that's on my radar. So last summer, I started working on this um, with Chris and Anna and Steve Roof at Hampshire College, just starting to make some of these measurements on the large-scale solar field at Hampshire College. And um, I'll be putting in a proposal probably this spring, um, but there's a ton of work to be done out there. Every state has different regulations on how large scale solar gets permitted, um, which makes sense in a certain respect because there's, there's different climate and different soils in every state. Um, one of the best states I found looking around is Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota, there must have been someone right out of their masters in watershed hydrology that got a hold of, uh, put it, they got tasked with, with writing the regs and they did a great job. Um, that said, I think one of the places to look is just look around to state permitting guidelines. Um, with respect to, um, you know, we, we, we don't have time to wait for years and years for the academics or to sort of make a ruling on this and for the EPA and various, various agencies to weigh in. 
Um, one thing I will say that's unique about solar is with respect to the construction, the footprint is really, really big. Um, it is rare that you have a 20, 30, 40, 50 acre um, intensive construction project the way you have with solar. So that's one thing to keep in mind of. And we see it with respect to, you've seen it in Southampton, in Williamsburg, uh, in Haydenville, there've been multiple issues with, um, with severe runoff from the construction projects. And so I think that's one thing to be mindful of as permitting is going forward. Um, it's, and I'll, I'll push back on Beth and say, it's not like construction. Um, it's, it's, well, it shares a lot of similarities, but there are things that's to be aware of that are different. The, the footprint is really large. And the second thing is, my guess is that the slopes tend to be steeper. Um, the places where people are, are willing to put up some solar panels are probably different from where you'd wanna put up a target. Um, and so between the large footprint and the steep slopes, um, I think it's just something to be on people's mind. And as at the state level in writing the regs, I think um, added stormwater protection are gonna have to be necessary depending on the footprint and the slopes um, beyond what might be relevant for you know putting up a target which might be 10 acres as opposed to 50. All right I'll get off my soapbox. Okay thank you Brian. Uh, Jack and then Aaron. Yeah I um, Brian and I uh, walk our dogs occasionally together so we have we've had some conversations uh, about uh, solar development and water resources and things like that uh, but I do have a uh, you know, a good deal of experience from the consulting side. I'm obviously on the planning board as well, but I have gone, you know, drilled down uh, on a project. Uh, it was in central Massachusetts, uh, uh, proposed solar, solar development. So I kind of did a white paper myself. So I have, you know, I, I would I would volunteer um, for the committee. I've looked at a lot of different angles on it, but, you know, I can't really add much more than what Brian and John have said, but, um, you know, there's, it's it's certainly an interesting uh, topic, and uh, uh, so I'll leave it at that. All right, I've got Brian and Jack on my list. <laughs> um, Aaron. Aaron, yeah. Sorry, get distracted by that. Um, I was just gonna say that um, I recently had a conversation. Um, with Kathy Ramiro. She's a regional planner at the um, DEP drinking water program. And um, she had suggested that, that um, the town of Amherst ask that the um, solar guidelines are followed um, that DEP puts out for um, the purposes to provide guidance to public water suppliers on information to be submitted to Mass DEP for wind and solar projects proposed on lands owned or controlled by public water systems for drinking water purposes. And I know that these projects aren't proposed on land that's owned by the public um, or controlled by the public, but um, I think it would be really useful to provide these guidelines to the project proponent and ask them um, if they could try to address the comments to keep the projects um, as they design them um, in compliance with those guidelines to try to protect the watershed lands as much as possible. Um, sort of some common sense uh, design standards um, that would um, take into account how they're designing things to try to keep the watershed safe. And um, I know a lot of these guidelines are not apples to apples. Like um, one of the requirements is, or one of the guidelines is to keep battery storage out of zone one. Now I know we don't have zone one in this area, but we do have zone A and zone C. And so, um, you know, if, if we could try to, come up with some, you know, ways to mitigate the project prior to it coming forward. Because I know a lot of times when these projects are designed, um, you know, then once they're submitted, asking them to go back and revise them 
is a, is a lot of work and it's it's a lot of money. And so if we could, you know, prior to the design being submitted, ask the proponent to take these guidelines to, into consideration, I think that would be really useful. That's an excellent suggestion. Thank you. Good research. Um, anyone else uh, on the committee have comments? Great. Uh, I will say that I will. Jack um, does. Yeah, I see that. Um, I will work with uh, Jack and Brian to put something together for this for the committee. So, uh, Jack. Yeah, I was just curious, you know, we have Dave uh, Zomack here. Um, so is the nature of the zoning bylaw that the town will be working on, will it include wind uh, and, you know, these battery storage and kind of be a little more encompassing than just ground mounted solar? That's a really great question, Jack. Um, we've really been focused you know, to the degree that the council is talking about this and and the um, CRC is talking about it, most of the focus has been on a bylaw for for solar. But certainly, we could, you know, we could insert that into the conversation. Um, I know tonight the CRC uh, on their agenda tonight is is talking about the. Uh, the moratorium, but I, I know that I'm I'm also working with the town manager and 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 other staff on kind of the the longer term is you know how do we how do we work on a solar bylaw? Um, so I think we first have to you know see where the council wants to go with the moratorium, and then we'll we'll proceed to look at the broader question of a uh, you know uh, a townwide solar bylaw but yeah we could we could certainly look into that I, I don't know what other communities have done relative to to wind and geothermal and and things of that sort but it's a good it's a good question a good good thought thank you uh, anyone else great and I think um it's time that we took comments from the public. I cannot see folks, so you'll have to let oh. them in, Beth. Okay. All right, we'll start with um, Janet Keller. Thanks, Janet Keller, um, Pulpit Hill Road, Amherst. Um, uh, first of all, thanks for this um, this discussion and presentation, um, much appreciated. And um, my main thing going forward is to ask um, if we can have these materials posted online so that we can um, consult them. That would be um, very much appreciated. And that's basically it, thanks. Yes, we can do that. Thank you, Janet. All right, uh, Sharon um, Weisenbaum. Hi, thank you. I so appreciate you all meeting to sort of address these issues. And my question is, if you could um, clarify for me what the role of this water protection, water supply protection committee is in relation to the proposed or soon to be proposed solar developments. Um, it seems like the role of this committee, like you have, you don't meet very often and that the scope of what's potentially coming down the road is huge compared to issues that you had to deal with in the past. And so I think part of my question is just to understand what your role is relative to this. And also, do you see your role sort of um, increasing 
in response to these potential um, threats to the Amherst water supply. That's it, thank you. Um, so the Water Supply Protection Committee is an advisory committee to um, town council and our really charge is to um, keep track of the current water demand and potential future um, water demand, drinking water demand of the town, um, just uh, based on, on data and also to keep track of a lot of the data that the water department is collecting constantly on uh, the, the quality of our water. Um, and so that involves certainly the watershed, but also our water treatment plants um, and our distribution lines. Um, and then for, in terms of the watershed, you know, we are charged with uh, keeping an eye on the watershed in terms of potential development projects. Um, and being in contact with the towns of Shrewsbury and Pelham in terms of their review and permitting processes. And in this case, you know, I, I feel like um, providing our opinion, um, at least at this point where there's not even any projects that have been designed and, and submitted to Shrewsbury and Pelham, I think um, just being involved in sort of Amherst technical opinion of what um, solar, how solar could impact um, drinking water is, is where we're at at the moment. Do I think it could be expanding? I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I guess we don't really know because we don't really know what projects have been, uh, are, are going to uh, come forward in these towns. On the town, the, the committee is also very involved with as we mentioned, um, conservation within the watershed. So um, purchasing lands that become available for, or, you know, de deciding if lands that do come available are, would be uh, good to add to our, to the watershed. I don't know if that answers your question or if others want to chime in on that. I will say that, uh, well, certainly we can provide opinion. Um, to our neighboring towns in the watershed. Um, these lands are not available for sale. So we, at this point, we can't purchase them for conservation or watershed protection. Um, and there's not much that this committee or the town of Amherst can do to stop development on private lands within the watersheds. Um, but we can provide opinions to, um, say, the Shootsbury Conservation Commission about things that we hope they consider um, in their approval process. Um, and we can provide those to the developers, since we know who it is, um, and ask that those guidelines be incorporated in the design from the beginning. about the limit of what we're able to do. Anyone else have something to add to that? John? I think I'll, I'll add is that the committee or, or members of the committee have a history of uh, meeting and doing things as needed to help the public. We've we've gone to the select board, we've addressed specific issues related to health, contaminant, whatever. So I, I think the committee, while we regularly meet once or twice a year, we have on occasion had many more meetings and, and done things in support of uh, the, the town uh, staff in their work. And I just wanna add that, um, you know, under the water, the drinking water regulations, um, we are required because we, we run our, our drinking water program, we are um, required to be involved with some of the zoning in those other towns and make sure that that those towns, or at least, again, it's not make sure, it's work with them and suggest to them that they include in their zoning um, water supply protection. And as I mentioned earlier, both Shootsbury and Pelham are, are, are pretty up to date and include um, water supply protection in their zoning. And they both recently passed solar bylaws that, that are, they were 
relevant to, to this discussion. So I would say, you know, Amherst in that responsibility has has been has been very involved um, more historically with making sure that those towns meet that sort of zoning requirement of the drinking water regulations. Um, okay, so Eric Backrock would like to make a comment. Eric. Uh, thank you so much for recognizing me. I do appreciate the, uh, um, the, the wonderful work that the uh, Watershed Water Supply Protection Committee is, has undertaken. Um, uh, I live on Shutesbury Road, and although the conversation from the, uh, the regarding the um, watershed area is is for public water supply, um, my I and my neighbors are supplied water on private wells, and I know for a fact that when we dug a well in 1980 for our flow rate was three gallons a minute. And I'm wondering if anybody could address consequences of, um, uh, of deforestation um, regarding um, uh, um, uh, impact on, on private well systems and, um, uh, and uh, j just how, although where your conversation is regarding the public water, we do have many people in Amherst who are provided water through their private wells that are per potentially in, uh, in danger. So I'm concerned about that. If you can perhaps either address it or, 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 or um, uh, um, move me uh, uh, into a better um, a place to ask this question to the Board of Health or some, someone like that. So thank you. Yeah, I would have to say that I, I, I have no um, direct information on that. And, and you're right that in Amherst, the Board of Health is, is much more involved with private wells and may have a little bit more research on um, that kind of thing on uh, construction projects in general, solar, but even just like you're saying, um, clearing of trees and stuff and their impact on private wells, but maybe uh, some folks on this committee might have some information. I don't know. I guess I'll take a stab at this and say that uh, in general, every private well is going to respond differently to uh, changes in its in its watershed, um, and in the big picture these potential proposed solar projects um, are not likely to impact your private wells in a negative way, um, but that's not a guarantee. Um, Thank you. I don't know. Anyone else? I mean, I would just uh, yeah, say that, you know, private wells are, uh, uh, the 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 subsurface geology and the and the surface geology that's affecting the, both the flow and the quality of the water coming out of your well is a complicated site specific situation and um, it's really hard to predict uh, activities like blasting so can sometimes uh, nearby can sometimes cause significant disruptions to private wells, you know, thing, things like that. I, I agree with Ryan's on the, 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 the footprint of this relative to the, the, the world. I mean, your private well water may well have infiltrated the ground many, many, many miles from your house and, uh, and gotten to that well. We, it's, it's complicated. So uh, I can bring David, Ryan's colleague, David Bout, and talk about <laughs> isotopic analysis, where water comes from, what it does. But anyway, it's a complicated question. Um, uh, that doesn't have a simple answer, uh, but yeah. Uh, we'll Jack, do you have your hand up? I do. Um, so I can say what what I said uh, during a planning board meeting when we were looking at this, and you know, from a mile high view, um, the solar, you know, ground mounted solar projects, uh, they're not. You know, when you think about uh, hydrology, and and Brian, you can. <laughs> Correct me if I'm uh, wrong here, but you, you basically say if you have a forested uh, track of land, you're essentially replacing it with, with grassland. 
Okay, so it, it's you, the solar, you know, cannot be considered as paved area. So, you know, ba basically, and, and the other thing Actually. is solar, uh, from what we know, there's no hazardous materials this that are brought on site. And that's important to know. So, you know, I think in some of these situations, when you're thinking about replacing a, uh, a stand of forest and replacing with grassland, and you look at the hydrological, you know, differences between those, um, you know, there's not gonna be any blasting. Um, it just, it, there's just, <laughs> so, you know, generally you're looking at a change uh, due to ground cover. And believe it or not, a forested tract takes up a lot of groundwater because of evapotranspiration, especially during, you know, July, August, September. And, you know, pardon me? Anyway, uh, anyway, yeah, it's definitely complicated, uh, but not as, as um, you know, I, I agree with Lyons. It's, it's generally gonna be, you know, mild to uh, no effect on, on private wells. Um, other comments from the public? Beth? Again, I was muted again. Um, Cinda Jones would like to talk, would like to make a comment. Cinda? Hey guys, thanks for all your time on this. I just wanted to give a little context and answer some questions that maybe I'm the only one who can answer. So um, I have written down a couple notes. I'm gonna try to get through. Um, so the town of Amherst asks us all the time to protect land that they're concerned about. And I think every time we have said yes. And most recently it was, um, Guilford asked us for land right on the, what side would it be the east side of the Atkins Reservoir within that 200 foot buffer. And uh, David Zomack asked for a Cushman piece and we were thrilled to do it. Our land is in chapter 61, which means that you do have a right of first refusal to buy it for the price that we're being offered over time by the solar company, which is pretty much probably means you can't buy it but you you had the opportunity it's it's um part of the 61 agreement um the land that we did the conservation restriction um was initiated by Kristen DeBoer of the Kestrel Land Trust as all our 5,500 acres of conservation was she is the driving force and she asked us to do this one because it's conserving watershed land. And the US Forest Service had this special grant available and so did um, the state to help protect land that affects watersheds. So we put 2000 acres of watershed land for the Quabbin and um, Amherst in conservation. We are dedicated to like you doing the right thing for the environment. And so not only are we doing landscape level conservation but we are dedicated to achieving uh, mutual environmental goals uh, for 2030 and 2050. And green energy is critical. And we believe that to achieve our, our legacy goal of leaving this place better than we found it, uh, landscape level solar is important. We left these exclusions out of our conservation restrictions expressly for solar because um, we wanted to do both. The town of Shutesbury has a pretty exorbitant um, and nobody else could meet it um, goal of getting four times conservation for, for every acre of solar. And um, we did 10 times in the area and, and thought that this would be um, an important thing to do in it. And it's interesting, we, it was 150% of what we were supposed to do for solar. Interestingly, the runoff from the solar, um, everything between, uh, especially three of the solar sites to the reservoir is protected. So it's, it's pretty, the ground is probably gonna be quite cleaning in my opinion. 
Um, let's see. Uh, the footprint is small. It's not like Walmart. It's uh, pole mounted with a meadow underneath. So well, the panels do shed in a line instead of in a larger area, it's consistently shedding into the meadow and is not like roof runoff. Um, it, there's still impermeable ground underneath it for the most part. Um, what else? Oh, uh, we were accused of threatening the water supply. We built the water supply. Um, Walter Dickinson Coles in, uh, four generations ago, built the Atkins Reservoir and the Amherst Water Company, which was sold to the town. We protected the land around the reservoir and we continue on a landscape level to protect. Um, I hope solar is an asset to this community environmentally and not a threat in any way that we can work with the town to make it do the right thing. Um, we're interested. so. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for providing context, Senda. Um, I think in particular, our, our greatest concerns are um, the overall design of the project and in particular, the stormwater design protections that could be put in place during construction um, and until the meadow um, is reestablished in or established in the area around the panels. Um, so we will certainly um, be in, in contact uh, with you regarding that. And it, it sounds like you're, um, willing to continue to work in those directions. So that's good. We appreciate that. We have other um, comments nope. from the public? I, I don't see any other hands raised. If um, I guess just to let everyone know who's out there, if you would like to make a comment, raise, raise your hand. But right now I don't see any. Nope, I think we're Great. good. And uh, Judy. Judy. <laughs> there, I forgot I had to unmute. Um, yeah, I, in res with respect to um, uh, Cindy's comment about Kristen DeBoer, She's absolutely right. Kristen is a force and I've been working with Kestrel for many, many years. And I think Kristen has done a fabulous job. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to just mention is that although I hear you saying that the stormwater uh, management is most important during construction, um, because the trees have been taking in a great deal of water uh, and now are not there. I, I think that you also have to look at uh, where that water is going once trees are cleared and how much more water there may be as a result of that um, tree removal. And also, of course, there is the carbon sequestration versus um, solar electricity production that enters into some of this stuff. So as I think, um, Lyons said, there is, uh, you know, it's a very complex problem, a very complex situation. And I think I agree with Cinda, we want to make sure that, um, that the solar is in fact an asset to the community. And, uh, and, and I believe that she does have the best of intentions on this. So I hope we can all work together. If a project comes into Pelham too. So that um, it's really more of an affirming. I think uh, if we if we use our heads and our common sense about this, we can move forward. I should say, as a point of uh, reference, I have a personal um, uh, experience with a project that was very badly managed in Williamsburg. Um, it happened to be my son's property that hit the news, 
And far from it being only a matter of, and it was a huge matter of no uh, uh, management during construction, far too many trees removed, he is still three years later having to deal with about, well, between 10 and 20 acres of his land being destroyed. And there are attempts to reconstruct. But if you screw up the wetlands from a hillside disaster, it takes a long time to mitigate it. Just saying. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Thank you. Well, I hear a... Um... A willingness to work with uh, the town on the part of the landowner and um, I hear a willingness of the committee to look into issues um, that we can uh, recommend to our neighbor towns um, and to the landowner for making this all happen in a way that's going to work for everyone. So that is good. And with that, I think we will move on to our last topic of the morning, which is scheduling our next meeting in September. And I will say that my preference of the three dates proposed is not the first one, as I have a conflict. We can do whatever we want, but my preference is the 22nd or the 29th. Um, anyone else have input to that? Shall we pick the 22nd? How about the 29th? This is Linda Arsenal. Either one is fine with me. 29th? John? <laughs> Jack, are you okay with the 29th? Clear right now. <laughs> Clear right now. Okay. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. You're scheduled. We will see you here. Okay. September 29th will be the date of our next meeting. Uh, are there any other topics we did not get to put on the agenda that have come up recently? Uh, I just I just want to mention the um, conflict of interest law uh, forms that I sent out to everybody and just make sure you um, sign your acknowledgement form and get it back to the town clerk. Has everyone done that? Yes? No, no I, I'm in arrears. Who <laughs> <laughs> okay. dealing with faculty and their conflict of interest forms for research. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah do, your, do your best to get it over there. I will, I will do so. All right. Beth, Beth, you mentioned new members. Who are the new members, the new committee members? I think you're the newest. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> right. Okay. I don't know if you meant I don't know if you meant during the, the watershed discussion, but I, I since I've started, which I think was close to when you started, I don't know how much we've shown the watershed map and um, you know, just shared all the parcels, who owns what. Um, so I wasn't sure who had seen that map recently, so. Very good, thanks. Yeah. Sure. Linda, there's new relative to say lions or, or me, maybe. It's <laughs> a relative term. Re relative, yeah. 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 <laughs> Great, lions so uh, Beth, you're gonna post the, um, the materials someplace on, I guess the website? Yeah, that, uh, I will. The maps so that the public can see those and reference them. Yes, yes, I can put Excellent. them on our committee website. I think I think that's probably the best, the best bet. Okay. But I'll I'll think a little bit about it. But yeah, I yeah. can I can put them. That's fine. So we we just chose the 29th, right? Uh, yes, September okay. 29th. I'll send out an invite. Okay, thank you all very much, John. Oh, John, uh, is Beth, any chance Thanks. you could share the or somebody could share us the bio, solar bylaws of Shrewsbury and Pelham? What what they wrote. Sure. Yeah. Yes. I thought I shared this. I find them, but I didn't look. But thank you. And uh, apologize for being late. I couldn't find the, the, the link. Um, Aaron? Uh, yeah. Aaron, could you share with Beth the reference of the uh, materials that, that you spoke about? We 
get those in the notes so they're part of the record. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, think, I was I gonna say, I think I, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I think I sent the, at least the regulations to you guys once, but we can, I can send them no, again. Just, and the policy. Make sure they're included in the, in the minutes for today and that, that'll be helpful. They were yeah. also requested by um, by Tom Reedy, and I sent those along to him just while we were on the call. So, um, so, so he has them to share with uh, Coles. Okay. Well, I don't know him. So, great. Um, Jack, One question: Did did we have minutes to approve, or? Ooh. Yeah, we probably did. Oh. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I know we had what the September 16th. Wait, that's yes, <laughs> we do have them. Um, should we vote on those? <laughs> they were sent out, and they were sent out a long time ago. I don't have any changes to them. But I, oh, they misspelled oh, Brian's wow. name. Oh, <laughs> that's big. I'll fix that. <laughs> Yell on. Yes, I correct myself on that an <laughs> awful lot. Okay, does anybody else have any changes? Other than that. No. Nope. Okay. okay. Approved. So yeah, we should. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And it's approved. Great. I just, this is Linda again. I did have a comment to make on the solar arrays. When I was out west, we did permitting on solar arrays and they put up wattles and banks to ensure no runoff. They put up metal uh, guards for the trucks when they were leaving to ensure they didn't track anything off location. And we did dust control plans to ensure there was no particulate matter um, and which way it would be going when it did blow. So just FYI on that. No biggie. Mm -hmm. So standard construction mitigation measures. Correct. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you September 29th. Uh, Jack and Brian, I'll, we will be in touch. Um, while putting something together. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Thanks.